This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Program. This is episode 134. On this week's episode, could WWE be bringing back WCW? We've got some insider notes and details where Matt Riddle may be going and what happened to Timothy Thatcher in their pit match, as well as Jeff Jarrett, yes, Double J, in court again, this time with Impact. Nothing new here. Of course, we're going to give you the latest topics and trends in wrestling, and we're going to kick this bad boy off with our review of Double or Nothing. Doing it with me, as always, he is the doc, John Macaroon. What's up, cuz? Baby, FTR, the original FTR in the building, (laughs) about to record a little teaser as to what happened on Dynamite. Interesting, but maybe left you a little underwhelmed. I'm curious to get your reaction to a major tag team debuting but AEW had a good week man I'm not gonna lie double or nothing delivered everything that you would want in terms of storytelling everything that you would want in terms of good matches uh and obviously look we've said in previous podcasts that these produced matches are a little bit overdone but it was so wild on whatever the hell AEW was trying to do with that stampede match that it was beyond even you know discussing it was so crazy with with spots, with just the creativity, with showing up in jerseys. AEW, really, and because I think you're noticing it too, is they're taking this opportunity and they're blending it with creativity and storytelling and the personalities. It's like basically you understand that, okay, these wrestlers have taken all their knowledge and said, yes, we can do X. We can do the standard type of matches and cards and things like that. Or we can take all the experience that we have, given all the things that we know make people pop, and then even top it one step further. They're, they're, you can tell they're challenging themselves to go one step further in terms of creativity, in terms of thinking outside the box, in terms of weaving storytelling. All in all, I enjoyed Double or nothing. I felt like it was right there in the A category for the grade that I would give it. And just the nature of seeing uh, Cody taking a title and doing the things that you got to do. So I just overall felt like the pay-per-view delivered. There was not too many things I didn't like. Uh, obviously, maybe you could kind of maybe look at the whole pool spot and talking about drowning and things like that. But it was clouded in, in humor. Because of the fact that it was a three foot pool and Santana and Ortiz don't know how to swim and, and he's all scared to get in it. So it was more funny, but just coming off of the heels of a wrestler passing because of a water situation, it, it brought it to the forefront a little bit. So maybe that could have been diverted a little bit or maybe the words on commentary could have been a little bit more sensitive. But all in all, I felt like the right people got over and you and I kind of had the card decently, decently called. Yeah, I think with what you get with, especially with Double or Nothing, AEW is allowing wrestlers to express themselves to their full potential. You've got a great mix of guys who have ran pretty much every indie circuit, and you've got a mix of guys who have been in WWE. And now you take all that knowledge, and you take all that creativity, and you put it together, and you don't have guys in the back putting the matches together. You've got actual wrestlers putting matches together. And you've got wrestlers being able to to be themselves and be their character. Who knows your character better than you? You know your character the best, so go do what you have to do. And I think we got a great taste of that with Double or Nothing. I thought Double or Nothing was a fantastic pay-per-view. It kicked off with the buy-in match, which was the number one contenders match between Best Friends and Private Party. Best Friends ends up beating Private Party by pinfall. When we were going through the whole breakdown of, of who was going to win these matches... Just about every match on this card could have went either way. Best Friends winning this, I I think, was fine. I think Best Friends winning this was more of a reward for them for doing such good work when AEW had to go through and tape all of their episodes because there were days where Best Friends would end up wrestling four and five matches in one day to sit there and get stuff in the can 
because of everything going on with COVID-19. Now, we absolutely, and I do want to say this too that now, as a result, they're the number one contenders for the tag team titles, and it's well deserved. Absolutely. We move on to the casino ladder match, which I thought was was a spot fest at its best. Like, in a lot of times when we say spot fest, it, it, it's meant in a negative way. I thought this was it, it, it's such a it, it's such a compliment because there were so many so many big spots in this match, and Brian Cage is the last guy announced. And I don't know about you, but I popped hard for Brian Cage. I know Brian Cage from watching him in Impact. He was the Impact champion for a while. Brian Cage is a monster. Brian Cage ends up winning the casino ladder match and will now take on John Moxley at Fighter Fest. Brian Cage coming down with Taz, I love it. I think it's fantastic. I think it's really, really good for his character. What did you make of Brian Cage being not just not just the the, the mystery combatant, but also the winner of the casino ladder match and being paired with Taz? Absolutely. I thought that was the best part. You, and, uh, you know, there was a spot there where Taz looks into the camera and he's like, the bodies are going to keep a dropping. And you instantly make him credible right there and there. Uh, Brian Cage, like we said in previous podcasts, maybe, you know, some of the wrestlers that have been put in, in the title matches maybe been pushed too fast. Not the case with Cage. This is a guy that's worthy of getting a title opportunity. And I think both you and I maybe are going to have the same excitement level to see what the hell are him and John Moxley going to do in that ring? Because they're going to know no bounds. They could do some damage and put out some great matches. I think they could have a series of matches. I, don't, I hope they don't limit it to just one. And I just felt like, wow, uh, <laughs> what, a, what a debut and what a great way to have him debut on a pay-per-view with Taz and putting him right there in the title picture. Good stuff. I think in coming episodes, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about Brian Cage and just this physical stature. He's a physically imposing guy. On top of that, he's he's awesome in the ring. So I think in coming episodes, we'll break him down a little bit more and kind of get our audience a little bit more familiar with who he is. MJF goes on to defeat Jungle Boy by pinfall. I think one of the more interesting moves and something that we got wrong when we made our predictions, Cody ends up defeating Lance Archer by pinfall to win the TNT Championship. I don't again. I don't think this was a wrong choice. It, this this wasn't a bad move. This this was this was okay. This was not the way you and I thought it was going to go. But I think putting the belt on Cody does a couple of things. All right, you put it on Lance Archer. You help build a brand new guy, which is fantastic. You put it on Cody. Cody has been the face of this organization forever and a day. Cody has carried this organization since its inception. Cody has been the one who has uh, uh, basically carried the flag for AEW. By giving him this title, you are now saying, this is a main player, this guy right here. Even though he can't ever win the world championship here at AEW, this guy deserves it. And if he's not our number one, he sure as hell is our number two. And I have no problem with Cody beating Lance Archer. How did you feel about that? Yeah, absolutely, because of the fact that, okay, you know, you want to establish this belt for a wrestler that can perform weekly and give it the title, the prestige and the importance of a title like that, a new title for that brand. So Cody winning, it's fine. I just think that the reason why you and I both maybe deferred on that is that you could have enhanced this notion that, okay, this guy's getting close, and then the the first title that he wins is the world title, because in essence, Cody Rhodes is not a TV champion. I mean, come on now. It's right. like really starting him at the bottom, but it's a message sent, like, hey, you know, I'm going to be, a, uh, I'm going to take a title, bring it to television, do what I got to do with it, and it's kind of like, you know, maybe maybe he can elevate it to the prestige of like an intercontinental title or something like that, but... Right now, it just has the feel of a television title because of what you call it. But in the end, the emotion that he showed is fine because, it, you know, AW has been around now a year. So it wasn't like he got a title right away. It looks good on him. I like the match. I thought that uh, the DDT at the end was sweet. And, uh, you know, Lance Archer, well, he's going to he can do a lot. He can work some good matches, man. It's, it was good stuff. I like the the way the match w- went down and uh, good for Cody. He deserves it, and he'll do he'll do wonders with it on television weekly. There was a point in the middle of this match, and I had a couple friends over to watch it, and they said out loud, "Man, this match has been going on a long time." And I was like, "Yeah, but it's been a really, really good match. Like it 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 was one of the longer matches on the card compared to everything that we had got to this point. But it was such a worthwhile match, and it was such a good match from start to finish. 
And you're right, Lance Archer has a great career in front of him. And Cody Rhodes' DDT, while like looking right at Jake the Snake, was was such a cool little moment. I thought it was awesome. Uh, let, let's move on to Penelope Ford gets inserted for Britt Baker, who on AEW Dynamite says that she has a broken tibula. She wasn't in a she wasn't in a cast. She was just wearing a knee brace. It, it's a little bit weird for me. I think it's a little bit more than that. It might not even be a broken tibula, but either way, Britt Baker's done for a while. Penelope Ford gets inserted. Chris Statlander defeats Penelope Ford by pinfall. You then have Dustin Rhodes defeating Sean Spears by pinfall. That was another match that you and I both seen going a different way. Little surprise, Dustin didn't put over Sean. I'm not really sure what is or what they're doing with Sean Spears at this moment. Dustin Rhodes still has a lot less left in the tank, which is great. I don't know what Sean Spears' role is with AEW, and I'm not sure he knows what his role is in AEW at this time because there are matches that he has that I feel he should win, and then he has matches where he he just loses them. And what I see with him is I see a lot of WWE-style booking where it's a lot of 50-50 booking, and he's not necessarily the guy getting over. Am I am I kind of off in Mars here with this? Uh, yeah, it's it basically the best we can say. It's, he's off to a slow start in AEW, but he's on the roster, and I think sometimes it just takes a minute to get a foothold. And in this situation, I think it just probably was more for – the opportunity for Dustin to kind of get over and uh, to let people know, hey, uh, I'm not done yet. I'm not just the enhancement talent. And I think probably that one, that match probably could be considered a swerve where maybe they started out thinking Spears would go over heading into it. But then you realize, OK, long term wise, Dustin, if he's going to be an enhancement talent, maybe on the upper side, you know what I mean, has to be still believable. And he can't just be losing day in and day out, match in and match out. So for Dustin to win, it kind of elevates him just a little bit to get over on, on Sean Spears. And I think that Spears, if you take just a longer view approach, will have the opportunity probably to start with the TNT title. We'll get into better angles. Look for that probably the second half of 2020. I just think it's a slow start, building his character and getting into some matches, getting into a rhythm. But once they shine the light on him, He'll be fine. I think he'll get into the mid card, maybe even the upper echelon of the mid card, pretty fast. I think it's just a slow start. Yeah, do, but but exactly, you're right. It does have the feel of oh, he, he's resuming his WWE role. He's a jobber. Yeah, it, you, I hope you're right. Maybe just a, a little bit of a slow start, and hopefully, this latter half of 2020, he really gets going. It, it's just been a little bit underwhelming because he is a guy who has a lot of talent. He's a guy who's been in the business for quite some time. Now, we have a no no, no disqualification, no count-out match between Sheeta, who defeats Nyla Rose by pinfall to win the AEW Women's Championship. I thought this was a really, really good match. Uh, You have two women who are vastly different in size and in style. And I thought Sheeta had a fantastic match with Nyla Rose. And Nyla Rose did a fantastic job as well in this match. There were so many big spots on the outside of the ring And there was so much that took place inside the ring. I thought this was awesome. I thought, as this match kind of wore on, I became a little bit concerned because we both picked Sheeta to win this. I thought for sure Nyla Rose was coming out the victor probably halfway through this match. To see Sheeta win it was was kind of overwhelming, and I was excited for her. Absolutely. I thought that uh, in terms of a title change, well well deserved. Good match, and I'm looking forward to seeing now how the women's division is going to start to reshape going forward. Obviously, Britt Baker being out is going to be a huge loss, but she does a worthy contender. Even you could revisit it with Nyla Rose as well. So good, good pay-per-view match for the women. John Moxley ends up defeating Brody Lee by a referee stoppage to retain the AEW World Championship. John Moxley puts Brody Lee in a, in a sleeper or a rear naked choke. Brody Lee ends up passing out. The referee has to stop the match. I thought this was this was the right call. You've got a guy who comes in with a lot of steam, right? And we both thought it was a little bit early to put him in a match with John Moxley for for the championship. It just didn't feel like it was the right time. So instead of him losing by pinfall or by submission, he just passes out. It's a way to protect Brody Lee's character. It's a way to keep the belt on John Moxley a little bit longer. We both, I think, felt that this was this was just a little bit too soon to get both these guys in the ring. For this, for everything at stake, I like the way this played out. I thought this was a good, heavy match. 
It was a lot of hard bumps. I thought John Moxley winning was the right call. Brody Lee passing out was probably the best call and the best way to make a tenable situation a very good one. Absolutely. I thought it was a good match, worthy of a title, uh, a title match on a pay-per-view. Look, you and I maybe, I don't know how much question we had about John Moxley, uh, how he, his title reign would go because of some failed title uh, matches that he had in WWE. They just never really felt like, okay, he was a champion, but just never felt like he created signature moments. You know, now in AEW, he's got the belt. And he's having good matches worthy of being the title holder. So this run that he's on is excellent because you put him in the ring with a Brody Lee and instantly Brody Lee looks like, okay, this guy belongs. And the way the match was set up psych- uh, psychologically was pretty, pretty well done and the violence was good. I was intrigued. It was like there was no moment in the match where I was like, oh, let's end this. And so, you know, y- you could have said maybe Brody Lee could have imposed a little bit more, but I thought he got his stuff in and, um, it just was hard because you and I and probably the world, nobody believed that there was going to be even an inkling that he was going to have a chance to win. So maybe you could have done something where uh, he gets the win, but by DQ, like he has somebody come out, a debut, uh, someone else in, in in the crew come out and uh, further the storyline a little bit because it kind of has a feel now that this is over. So, you know, in this kind of feud, you could have had it a little bit more, especially knowing that you're going to be needing some good content. You could have had, you know, this not be about the title in the end. You could have had Brody Lee say, look, uh, you know, I'm here to impose my will. I'm going to have my crew do some damage to Moxley and maybe up the emotional level was one thing that just crossed my mind as I was watching it because I just never really believed that he was going to win. But uh, to go down that road of not getting pinned, just fine, probably the a minus way of doing it. A plus would have been, hey, give him the win, but just not give him the title. You know, I, I like what you brought up there because as I was watching the, the women's championship match, I thought something similar. AEW doesn't really do a good job of building what the next feud's going to be at the end of a pay per view. Like you, this was a, like you said, a prime, a prime spot where you could have had somebody from from the Dark Order come out and attack John Moxley and really get things going for for something to come up next. And you didn't get that. With with Sheeta, you could have had another woman come out and attack her after her championship win to really set up whatever that next feud's gonna be, to be like, oh, that's the next contender. With with the stadium stampede match, which we're gonna spend some time on that because it was I thought it was fantastic. I thought for sure we were gonna get the revival coming out and super kicking uh, the young bucks, but you didn't get that. It was it was a nice it was a nice farewell moment, and you got a lot of nice closure. And this is something we talk about with WWE. We don't get enough closure at the pay per view matches. You got that here, but all that being said, you could still take one or two of these matches and really set them up for the following dynamite to really get you invested in what's going to take place this upcoming Wednesday. Instead, it's just cool. This chapter's done. We move on now. This chapter's done. We move on now. And you don't get that continuation of a storyline. Whereas I feel like with John Moxley and Brody Lee, that would have been the prime opportunity to build in something to really help it move forward and really help it continue for the next couple weeks. Ooh, yeah. I like what you're thinking. I like where your head's at. Um, in regards to the way in which matches can be enhanced is that sometimes you just want to have a little bit more believability. You want to have a little bit more intrigue. You want to have maybe just a little bit more extension of some feuds. I mean, some feuds don't have to end right away in regards to potentially, uh, like, like for example, Sean Spears and Dustin. You could have that go on for months and maybe have a good series of matches where, you know, uh, in that match, Sean Spears goes over but does some excessive damage, you know, yeah. and goes over the line a little bit and, and, and moves it in or brings up something that's maybe a little inside that can uh, be a hint to go forward. But, hey, look, you got to do what you got to do, and sometimes there's no perfect way of telling stories. But, yeah, I think it can be enhanced, and that's a great point that you made. Things can get just a little bit better in regards to the matchmaking because there's no rush. It's a different time. You don't have to end feuds in 30 days. You can do it over months. And some, potentially, that are being tapped – Maybe you and I would want to have different participants in those extended feuds. Like, obviously, you're going to have the inner circle and the Young Bucks crew. You're going to have, you know, the elite. They're going to feud. 
So that's understandable, but maybe some of the mid cards, uh, mid card talent can get some of that exposure too. Yeah. So for, for our main event, for this pay per view, we had our stadium stampede match, which, could have went a thousand different ways. And I think what we got was exactly what we needed. This was a long main event. It had a lot of combatants. There was a ring set up in the middle of, of a field, of a football field, that was never touched. I had a buddy over who who watched wrestling when he was a child, hasn't watched wrestling in years, and was like, what the hell is going on here? And when it was all said and done, he was like, that was fantastic. It was really entertaining. I think the stadium stampede match could have went horribly wrong. But what we got was something that was so fantastic and so much fun. It was wrestling at its finest. A couple of weeks ago when we were watching wrestling, we we, we had the I, – I believe I made the comment that professional wrestling is grown men doing the impulses that – young children have it was something to that effect i think i've cleaned it up a little bit because as i've marinated on it a little bit i've 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 put it in in a way that i think sounds a little bit more i don't know i don't know like i got a good vocabulary who knows i i what you get with this stadium stampede match is you get grown-ass men playing out the actions of young children and it was awesome you had Matt Hardy in the pool switching to to from broken Matt Hardy to to version one Matt Hardy. You had the spot with a with a bell uh, and, and and Santana's head, and he was in it. And he's like, you go to AEW on on Wednesday, and he still has ringing in his ears. You had um, Kenny Omega hitting a one wing angel off of like the highest point in in the stadium through a bunch of different stuff. It, it was. This was such a fantastic, fantastic match. You had Hangman Page come out with a with a field marker and run over Chris Jericho, run over the middle of his crotch and all the way up his chest onto his cheek. It, it was you, you just had <laughs> moments where you just laughed because it was so good and it was so funny. You had Hangman in in in, in, in Kenny Omega inside of a bar and Hangman pours Kenny Omega a, a milk in in. Omega Pours Hangman a whiskey. It, it just it worked, man. It was so freaking good, and it could have been so damn bad, but it was a fantastic way to cap off what was a fantastic, another fantastic AEW pay per view. Couldn't have said it better myself. The only thing I'm going to add to what you said was we're now seeing the emergence of a star. I don't know if you caught it, but Sammy Guevara held his own in a match with Legends. Sammy stood out to me, and I was like, wow, if this guy gets highlighted, just wait like three, four years. You put uh, the combination of his personality, his in-ring work, his learning from these guys that he's been around. I was like, you know what? Sammy Guevara has something here, and that's why he's in this group. I think that uh, you know Chris Jericho has tapped this guy to be somebody that can be enhanced and can be looked at, and in that match, I just – he stood out and, and obviously everyone else got their stuff in. And I just love the, I love matches where you just had people probably writing stuff down and they were just like, yeah, let's do it. You know, we want to have a horse. Let's just do it. We want to have a yeah. pool. We want to use Matt Hardy's gimmicks. Let's just do it. And we want to, you know, I, I think what was funny was, uh, and, uh, Santana and Ortiz highlighted it when they were against the rail. Uh, he did that on purpose where, uh, Kenny Omega's on the rail and, and, uh, Santana and Ortiz, like uh, one of them grabbed him and pushed him like it was a rope, and he said, and, and he they said, oh, someone caught that. They did it intentionally to kind of be a little bit silly, you know, trying to make it where he gets thrown into the arena. So there were just little spots here, and they were kind of funny, and overall, just a well crafted, wild ass match that it will live, you know, in time in AEW's history because of the fact that it was so wild and so crazy and uh good for the pay-per-view like I said it gets an A A minus if you want you want to be critical a little bit but uh overall worth your time and effort if you haven't seen it yet go check out Double or Nothing wow what a what a performance uh, I think what you had in that Stampede match was you had you had guys at at different points in their career right so you had Chris Jericho who's Who's the, the, the sturdy veteran, right? The guy who has done it all 
and it, and is a a top notch main card player. And then you've had guys who have basically ran the industry for the last couple years with uh, Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks. And then you have a guy who will soon be taking over the entire industry with Hangman Page. And then right behind him, you have a guy like uh, Sammy Guevara, who is maybe maybe a year or two, maybe three years away, but is going to be extremely special. So it's really great to see these different variations uh, of talent and where these guys are at in their career, and they come together to put on a fantastic match. When we look at the predictions, we ended up tying. We got five apiece, so we'll split the point. You've got three and a half. I've got four and a half. We'll continue this on. I believe the next pay-per-view we'll look at will probably be WWE's Backlash, and that'll be coming up here shortly. Um, right now, I kind of want to transition into biggest topics and trends, and I want to stay with AEW. We'll get into WWE, but I want to stay with AEW because I thought AEW's Dynamite on Wednesday night was fantastic, although there were a couple of things that felt a little bit wonky. So we get our, our first reveal of the Revival or FTR as they're going by now, Fear the Revolt. To me, it felt super lackluster. I don't think, I think I did a better job putting it over in my living room than JR did and Tony did and Excalibur did when these guys showed up. I don't think they did a good enough job putting these guys over. And a lot of times what you'll get is when a brand new wrestler joins a federation or joins an organization, you will have that moment where they show up and the announcers are like, wait, wait, who are these guys? And then it takes them a second, takes them a second. Wait, this is, and in their case, it would be cash and, and whatever the other, I, I don't remember. It's whatever, FTR. So um, you would get that, and you, you wouldn't know exactly what their name is. They, at no point would you, would you mention them as FTR. What they would end up doing is they would get a microphone, and they'd cut their own promo to announce themselves. And then the announcers would be like, there you have it. That's FTR. That's Cash Wilder and whatever Dawson's name was. I, I don't remember what his name is off the top of my head, but you didn't get that. Instead, the announcers knew exactly who these guys were, and it felt like they were just guys coming from the back. It didn't feel like they were special. If you didn't know that 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 the Revival slash FTR were coming to AEW, you would have just thought, hey, those are some new guys that, that came out the back. That's how I felt. Am I like... Yeah, no, here? no, I can understand because you wanted to have that moment, but unfortunately, there's no crowd. So, you know, they're in daily place. And so they, I just think it's one of those situations where if you didn't know that FTR was going to show up at AEW, something was wrong with you. And so I just felt like they handled it where a little bit more of the intrigue was who are they going to attack? Were they going to attack the Young Bucks? Were they going to attack the other tag team in the ring? And so for me, it was fine. Um, yeah, it could have been done in a little bit different way, but it was cool to see them, man. It was nice to see them show up and have that big tag team feel. So for me, I thought their debut was just fine. It, I think that it was good that they didn't do it at the pay-per-view. They showed, they, they it came out on AEW television. And I think that, uh, you know, sometimes less is more. You can't have every single debut being wild, you know, especially with Brian Cage. You had Brody Lee having a fantastic one. This one's a little bit more subdued, but also because you got to remember, this kind of suits their personality. You know, this is FTR. This is not a team that's going to need a lot of fluff. They got in the ring, and right away you're like, oh, boy, what, who, who, what are they going to do? And instantly I think the comment that, I don't know if you caught it, where they uh, – where I think it was Shivani said, you know, uh, Young Bucks and FTR – would have legendary matches, and it's so true. So let's just get right to business, and I think with that, it's kind of on brand. Right to business, show up, and get to work. And I think with a team like that, I think that's the the brand you want to kind of keep. So last pop and circumstance in this moment, I'm okay with it. We'll see how it plays out. I just felt like it was a little bit underwhelming, especially because we've been so high on these guys coming over for so long. Yeah. We'll see how it works out. I want to talk about Cody Rhodes. I mentioned at the top how he's basically been carrying AEW. He has been the face of this brand. He comes out with Tony Schiavone in the ring, and he cuts a fantastic, fantastic promo. At this moment in time, I don't know if there's anybody better in the business 
than Cody Rhodes at what he does. Cody Rhodes' promo was so damn good, it got me comparing him to Dusty Rhodes, and I went onto YouTube, and I Google searched different Dusty Rhodes promos, and I and I juxtaposed those with, with what Cody gave us. I think Cody, at this moment in time, is the best, the absolute best. And it doesn't matter if he has a title. It doesn't matter if he doesn't have a title. It doesn't matter whatever that title is. I don't know if there is anybody right now, WWE, AEW, Impact, Ring of Honor, New Japan even, that can hold a torch to what Cody Rhodes is bringing every single time we see him. You are getting some of the best matches, some of the best promos, and you are getting some of the best work as far as a work rate goes from this one individual. There's one, and you look at it in terms of classes. There's a lot of guys that can do, you know, decent promos like Edge, like Randy Orton, but there's really only one other guy that's in the class of promos as Cody Rhodes, and that's... um, the fiend Bray Wyatt. That's it. That's a guy that when he talks and it's so creative and so off the wall that sometimes you probably half the time don't understand what the hell he's saying, but you just want to listen. So I'll, I'll that, say this. I'll say this. His promos are great. His yes. in, in-ring work loses me. His matches yeah. I find to be boring as hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The, the in-ring work definitely can be enhanced by a lot and absolutely but in terms of the promo that's the only guy in the class but you're right Cody Rhodes is coming into his own you can see the development he's working on the craft and I mean you knew when you're coming from the you know the man himself Dusty Rhodes you're his son you're gonna have to be able to step it up on the promo game and he's been given the opportunity and he's taking advantage of it seizes the moment and you know and I think he relishes that that notion that, hey, any airtime is precious time, and he, he takes advantage of it week after week. So now we're going to see him every single week with the title. So th- that uh, that can only be a bonus for AEW and, and the fans. I want to talk about what AEW isn't afraid to do. So we've got we've got Chris Jericho at the very end of, of Dynamite. You've got Chris Jericho, and you've got the whole inner circle out in the ring, and they're exchanging gifts and talking about what they want. And Jericho is the last to really speak about what he wants coming off of a major defeat to the elite and broken Matt Hardy. And he says that he wants Mike Tyson's head on a platter. And what AEW does and what AEW's announcers aren't afraid to do and what AEW has makes no bones about is reaching into WWE, whether it be the past like it is with this Mike Tyson situation or just discussing previous wrestlers' histories. They have no problem bringing up WWE, which if you're a wrestling fan, I think is fantastic because all too often you get WWE where these guys have zero past. They've done nothing anywhere else. Only thing that matters is what they've done here in WWE. AEW has no problem leaning into what you've done in your past, and I love it. They bring Mike Tyson and Chris Jericho together. And I, I think it was a little bit of a messy spot because I don't think Mike Tyson holds up his end of the bargain very much. Mike Tyson is, is a lot of flash. I don't think he has enough sizzle. So Jericho has to really do a good job of, of corralling that and, and really helping to build this. I think it's going to work out fine, but there's a lot of heavy lifting that has to be put on Chris Jericho for this to really work out the way it's supposed to. But they had no problem. Chris Jericho has no problem going in and saying, you know what? Here's my problem. Basically, it happened on a Monday Night Raw when I was going up against DX and you punched me in the face. I loved it. I thought it was great. I think it's cool that AEW has no problem, no problem swimming with the big boys in the pool and saying, that's cool. We'll call you out by name. Or we'll make subtle references so people have to go figure out what we're talking about. And by figure out, I mean just type into Google real fast. So they are on the same page. I love that AEW talks to wrestling fans like they're educated and they're smart people. I think it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Remember, the owner is a mark. So this is what you're going to get. He's not afraid. I mean, they're there. They're aware of it. Um, I think it 
lends to the notion that AEW is comfortable. Look, we know where we are. We're doing our own thing. We're not trying to take down the billion dollar giant. We're just trying to put out good content every single week. We got stars. Look, they're still bringing in stars from WWE and getting them over in a different way. Because look, it's just a different company. Straight up. AEW is on the come up. WWE is established and just trying to appease shareholders and make the most money and put on as good a content as possible. They're right now, you can tell, and we'll talk about it in future episodes. They're probably approaching a transition soon because, you know, Vince is going to be near 80 years old. So eventually there's going to be a transition of powership, uh, a transition of power that's going to take place. So they're kind of like in this holding pattern right now, just trying to put on good content. We're recreating some stars and, and trying to figure out how to best run the company. AEW is fresh and new, and they don't have to worry about, you know, oh, it's not a big deal to – look, you got the Young Bucks. So the Young Bucks have done so many things that have made people go, oh, you killed the business, that they don't care. They just do what they got to do, and it's just – have no problem with the manner in which they, they handle business. Look, seeing Mike Tyson's always cool, and to tie up a feud from 10 years ago, that's fine. It was wild, and it was cool too, bro, to see, and you're going to talk about it alternative type of people. I think AEW is embracing things that they think are successful. Now, we'll debate it in future episodes whether bringing in stars from the UFC and other type people is actually the way to go because it's been done before, but it draws attention. And to see some former UFC stars that I respected was cool because they look natural in the ring. They look like fighters, and the best is they made it look like that in the wild brawl. So it delivered. A+. plus. It was awesome. Yeah, I thought it was good. Um, like I said, the, the big issue I had is Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson smiling through the whole thing. It's weird. It's not natural yet. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's just, there, there, there are things that he, he's just not, he's Mike Tyson. So how are you going to tell Mike Tyson not to be Mike Tyson, right? How are you going to tell him to be, be a wrestler and, and sell the storyline? He's going to be Mike Tyson. So you just kind of, you just kind of have to deal with it. Um, is there anything else you wanted to discuss about Dynamite, or can we transition into SmackDown? Yep, it was all good, baby. Let's get to WWE. All right, so transitioning into SmackDown, you have a trade of AJ Styles to SmackDown, and AJ Styles has come out and basically said, hey, I like this. I think this is going to be good. It's going to help me get over the release of two of my best friends in, uh, in Gallows and Anderson. On SmackDown, he gets incorporated into the Intercontinental uh, uh, Tournament, so he is now competing for the Intercontinental Championship. And I think what we have here is a, a nice breakdown for a semifinal with Daniel Bryan versus Jeff Hardy. There's been a lot of talk about Jeff Hardy getting a push, as well as Elias versus AJ Styles. In your estimation, what would be the best finals match that you would love to see for the Intercontinental Championship belt? And I wonder if it's the same thing that I'm thinking. You're thinking a revisit of a feud? Potentially, I don't know. I, I see the, the thing is, do you put the belt on AJ Styles? Um, I'm not exactly sure on this one. I'm just enjoying it. Um, you know, an opportunity to see, you know, AJ Styles, Jeff Hardy, the other two combatants. You know, I'm, I'm curious. I don't have a favorite either way, but you know, AJ Styles returning to SmackDown, I think is great. Um, I wonder too that you brought up a point. I wonder if AJ Styles, how upset he is with the company for what happened. I mean, you're kind of now, kind of entering the twilight of his career last couple years and he's had his big run where's he at like it, it's worth talking about like okay this is aj styles is a legend people now know where he's at are you gonna start putting him in some like legendary type matches uh stuff like that but aj styles in the mix is good but i don't think he w needs to walk away I'm, I'm thinking for me personally if you're gonna have a run with jeff hardy the belt looks the best on him because everyone else has been established i think that eight uh jeff hardy Putting the belt back on him says, okay, this is the last one or two years that you got. You can then reestablish feuds with AJ Styles for something a little bit more. I like putting the belt on Jeff Hardy. I think it makes a lot of sense. But I think you have something here because it was it was an organic build from what you got with WrestleMania. You had Daniel Bryan versus AJ Styles beating the crap out of each other. If you go to YouTube and you YouTube uh, Brian Danielson versus AJ Styles, they have this yeah. match in this bingo hall. It is fantastic. It's like yeah. 46 minutes long. It is great. I think you have something here. If you can get these two in the final, and I don't necessarily care if Daniel Bryan goes over or AJ Styles goes over. It doesn't matter to me. But you have both these guys fighting for that belt only to have Sami Zayn come in and then you spin this feud off into something with him. So... I, I like the setup here. I think this is a really interesting final four 
it's going to be it's going to be fun to see who goes for the Intercont- Intercontinental Championship belt. But I, I love the fact that you've got Daniel Bryant and you've got AJ Styles here who can who, you you have a little bit here already. You've got a you've got a built in angle because of what took place at WrestleMania. So on Raw, what we're seeing here is you're seeing some new pushes. You're getting guys like Apollo Crews, who won his first championship. He won the U.S. Uh, the USA Championship off of, uh, or the U.S. Championship off of um, Andrade. And then you've got Bobby Lashley getting his first title shot in over 13 years. What do you make of these new pushes on Raw? Is this Vince being all forgiving and, 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 and all giving and saying, yeah, let, let's go with some of these guys who haven't either had a shot or some guys who need a little bit of a redemption tour or – is this more Paul Heyman being like, I see something with these guys. Let's go in this direction. Yeah, I think it's that. I think that you have to have opportunities for some people to um, look at situations and say, hey, you got to create new stars. And Apollo Crews is right there at the forefront. You have to have opportunities for some new people. So to see Apollo Crews get the title, I texted you, and you were like, what? Because I think we were both surprised that, hey, there are some opportunities for some new cats. And that's just the way I look at it is that you got – to have some new stars, and I think that Paul Heyman and those that are in the mix have to pay attention to it, and uh, you have to because, I mean, you lo- you lopped off a good chunk of some mid-card talent, so you can't just have the top guys, so you got to move forward with it, and uh, I'm okay with it. I think that, you know, um, in terms of the storylines, they're okay. Nothing really intriguing over there on Raw too much. Obviously, the mm-hmm. title holder, Drew McIntyre, I'm more intrigued now with NXT and SmackDown, but all in all, it's not a bad thing, not a bad look. So speaking of NXT, what did you make of the of the fight pit? You had Matt Riddle taking on Timothy Thatcher, and I've got some news about them coming up in the news and notes segment. But what did you make of the fight pit? Because I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought it was really, really cool. Uh, it was nice to see Kurt Angle still kind of kicking around. But I loved I loved the fight pit. I thought it was I thought it was something new. I thought it was inventive. I liked it a lot. Yeah, I thought it was great. I think for NXT, it's something uh, definitely to look at going forward. I thought Matt Riddle, I'm like, okay, if he's going to get the call up, he's ready. He's the guy, man, and uh, he's got it. Just, you know, one of those guys that the performers that you look at it and you go, all right, someone I want to watch, someone I want to see, and uh, who, what an entertaining match, huh? Yeah, it was it was good, and like I said, I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to kind of save some of it for for the news and notes segment because there were a couple things that took place in that match that we got to talk about. Anything else from uh, the world WWE that just really caught your attention that has you kind of uh, chomping at the bit looking forward? Not not at this time. I mean, that was kind of out of the out of the 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 three days of WWE. Those were the big stories that that I was watching that I kind of took out. Did you have anything that you kind of wanted to to mix into the pot here from WWE? Nope, it's all good, man. Looking forward to the week ahead. Definitely, you know, to see how this continuation happens, what's going to happen with some of the mid-card talent, and obviously to see what's going on with Drew McIntyre, Seth Rollins, Baron Corbin. Some good stuff going on, man. It's 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 really interesting. Just real quickly in the world of, uh, you know, online wrestling, definitely Kurt Hawkins did another great interview with Chris Van Vliet. Check it out. He's kind of a little bit more subdued, but they got a great podcast. Um, him and Zack Ryder do a really entertaining podcast, and so the interview with Van Vliet was interesting just to see that. Kurt Hawkins was released in 2014, I believe, and it was different then for him than this to go around, so he breaks it all down in a real measured way, and it's just real fascinating to look at a guy that was, you know, the character that had the 200 matches, the 200 losses plus, and how that, he kind of explained how that shook out. He had to fight for that, so it's a real interesting look, so something that if you're interested in stuff like like podcasts, Chris Van Vliet on YouTube interviews Kurt Hawkins, real interesting. All right, hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What you got? Darren Young's most successful run as a singles competitor in WWE came in 2016, a brief that saw him with Bob Backlund serving as his life coach. If you remember, Young and Backlund ran a series of Make Darren Young Great Again vignettes and promos. The run also briefly had Young adopting Backlund's cross-face chicken wing submission right until Triple H told him he couldn't use it anymore because of safety concerns. Young said it was Triple H that said, I couldn't use the cross-face chicken wing and it broke my heart. He said on the Lewis Nicholas show, he continued, the people aren't going to take me serious. I was so devastated. It's what it is. You either adapt or perish. That's saying, that's the model. 
Literally, you either a- adapt or you perish. At the end of the day, who's going to be running the company? It's going to be Triple H, and unfortunately, I wasn't a Triple H guy. Young said the people who work under Vince didn't have his back. It's unclear whether he was directly referring to Triple H, but he said McMahon's lackeys didn't like the idea of him getting over on his own idea, and that was his and not theirs. It's unclear how much the crossface chicken wing was related to Young's angle fizzling quickly, but the angle barely lasted a couple months. Months Young was released in 2017 from his WWE contract. I'm not sure. Do you remember that at all? I do. I do remember that. Yep. I do too. And it was it was one of those things where it, when it started, it was like, oh yeah, this is really good. And then all of a sudden, it faded to the background. It was it was weird. Uh, and sad news: 22 year old Hana Kimura of the World Wonder Ring Stardom Japanese female wrestling organization died on Saturday, May 23rd, due to an apparent suicide. She was the recent recipient of quite a bit of harassment. And it seems like it was just too much for her, and she took her own life. Jeff Jarrett and Impact are going to court again. Double J, who is the owner of Global Force Entertainment and Anthem Sports Entertainment, the parent company of Impact Wrestling, are heading to court. According to PW Insider, the two parties will be headed to court at the end of June. Jarrett and Global Force Wrestling are in the middle of a lawsuit with Impact that goes back to when the two parties worked together many years ago. Jared alleges that Impact broke the copyright rules using footage of Global Force Wrestling's AMP series. A court in Tennessee ordered both sides to try to mandate or mediate last month. Apparently, it didn't go well. Negotiations attempts were unsuccessful, and they could not agree to a deal that prevented a trial. Jared attended the mediation in person. However, Ed Nordholm appeared via teleconference. He, of course, is in Canada and not allowed to enter the United States. The official court date trial is set for 630 but everything going on with the coronavirus may not allow that to happen. Both sides have until June 12th to get their evidence and witnesses together. The trial is supposed to last about a week. Uh, Jared is currently a producer for WWE. The lawsuit has no impact on his status with WWE. Now, we've talked a little bit about Matt Riddle and Timothy Thatcher. So Matt Riddle will be headed to the blue brand. It's not clear if it will be if he'll be there tonight or if it'll be in the coming weeks, but it has been confirmed that he will be moving to SmackDown. Now, coming out of the pit match with Matt Riddle, Timothy Thatcher suffered multiple dental fractures from the rebound kick from Matt Riddle during their cage match yeah. main event. Now, when this took place, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, if you've ever had your teeth kicked out or broken and you spit them out, it is it is kind of off putting. Thatcher ended up winning the match. He was able to continue to fight. Um, he's going to have to have some, some – looks like he's going to have to have some dental surgery. He's going to have to follow up with an oral surgeon here in the next couple days. It was, a pre, it was a pretty crazy moment when it happened. I think Matt Riddle knew the moment that it happened because he kind of slinked back into the corner like, oh, shit, what did I just do? Exactly. So it was kind of crazy. It was almost surreal. A little brutal. Don't go into that category where you're Nia Jax hurting people, especially when you're wrestling barefoot. But you got to be careful, man. It's 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 look. It's not. Uh, they're not uh, dancing here. They're, it's professional wrestling. Stuff happens. But uh, yeah, brutal. And that's what they got to just be mindful of. Is you, you you can have aggression, but you can't be hurting people. Yep. Speaking of Nia Jax, it seems like she's garnering more heat. Uh, seems like in a taping, she hurt another one of her competitors. At some point, WWE is going to have to draw a line in the sand because Nia Jax just hurts too many people. Could WWE be bringing back WCW? Well, PW Insider notes that WWE has filed trademarks on the initials WCW for business ventures like cardboard packaging, collector albums for sticker collectibles, and temporary tattoo transfers. There has been glimpses of this in the past few years with WWE is slowly bringing back aspects of WCW with events like Starcade as well as war games taking place on NXT. If you recall, these events were staples of WCW. WWE is trying to, I think, infuse some new life. And if you kind of pull on the heartstrings of old WCW fans, you might be able to sway them from AEW. So it's going to be interesting to see what WWE does going forward. Ooh, so that's it for this week's news and notes. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Weekly and daily sports content. Make sure you check us out. Give us a subscribe on iTunes. Leave us a five star review. And when you're uh, out and about and you're looking at podcasts, all you gotta do is search Detroit Sports Podcast. When you hit the subscribe button, our content finds you daily, and uh, you can interact with us. 
definitely feel free to leave us a message if you agree or disagree with anything that we said. We love interacting with the wrestling fans. Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast drops every single Friday. Thanks so much, cause this was fun, man. I always enjoy taking a peek at professional wrestling, and uh, it's always a good time, man. It's gonna be a fun week. Uh, starting off with uh, SmackDown tonight. Absolutely, man. WWE's been solid. AEW's been fantastic. It was a good week of wrestling.